Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on person-centered therapy and counseling that accompanies my textbooks, Case Documentation and Counseling and Psychotherapy, as well as Theory and Treatment Planning in Counseling and Psychotherapy. And hopefully this um, lecture will help you use the uh, treatment plans and case conceptualization templates um, to help you use these theories with the clients you work with. So, um, person-centered therapy is probably the best-known uh, humanistic existential uh, counseling approach. It was developed by Carl Rogers, who many would consider consider one of the most important figures in the history of psychotherapy. And I, I think I know some people who would even argue more important than Sigmund Freud in many, many ways. So, and, and arguably, he was the most influential influential of all the humanistic existential therapists, although there are many important ones. And some of the commonalities across these approaches include, and this is one of the things that Carl Rogers was so influential in shifting the view of the, the um, field in terms of focusing on the subjective reality of the client. And so what that means is all of these humanistic approaches, they differ in many ways from, let's say, psychodynamic, or at least traditional psychodynamic, and traditional uh, cognitive by, uh, psychotherapy, in terms of focusing on what is the interior lived reality of the client and, and valuing that reality and trying to work from within it. And so, it, you know, psychodynamic would try to analyze it, and CBT would look at, you know, maybe irrational um, thought patterns that are going on or ineffective, the behaviorists were looking purely at behavior. But instead, the whole humanist, all these humanistic and existential approaches really look at the um, subjective live reality and they work from within it. There's a, uh, more of a respect for it in terms of that's the realm in which the therapy takes place rather than trying to get clients to um, move towards maybe more logical ways or more analytic ways, looking, you know, the, you know, the interpretation from the therapist. Instead, the, uh, the therapist is kind of entering that subjective world. Another really unique thing um, um, that Rogers introduced to the field of psychotherapy is that the therapist must have warmth and empathy. And especially when he first came on the scene, compared to traditional psychodynamics as well as the you know traditional CBT, warmth and empathy was really not their thing. I mean, you know, we're talking sitting on a couch, don't look at the therapist. You know, therapist is a blank slate. You know, they'd wear, you know, almost, you know, often the behaviorists and CBTs, you know, had very much the um, presence of, you know, someone in a lab type of um, scientific approach. And so this was really different to have warmth and empathy. And I would say that most clients kind of expect that warmth and empathy in the 21st century and that way of kind of connecting, not all, but it is generally, I would say more and more. And I would say most contemporary approaches, um, you know, CBT as well as psychodynamic have much more warmth and empathy um, in them. And it's I believe Carl Rogers is really the leader in introducing that, and that is one of the reasons I think he is so influential in the field. Another unique thing that all these approaches focus on is what they call the self of the counselor. So who are you as the therapist, as the counselor in the room, and that who you are matters. You're not a blank slate, and your way of being, the presence you bring into the room is crucial to facilitating the change process in this particular, in these humanistic approaches and existential approaches. And you'll notice this across all the different approaches that the self of the therapist, self of the counselor, um, those are really central in promoting the change process. And there's also the, the end goal for all of these approaches it looks at self-actualization and also looking often at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this the concept of all of these, um, the big picture behind all of these humanistic and existential approaches is that you're trying to help the person self-actualize, to become fully who they are. And we're going to talk more about that in the lecture. So these are some of the common themes that we see across the humanistic existential approaches. So in a nutshell, the least you need to know about person-centered therapy. So 
Carl Rogers spent his entire career focusing um, on the th what he called the core conditions that he hypothesized, and he spent his whole career researching this and exploring this hypothesis, that these three core conditions were all that were necessary, and these were also sufficient for change. And the first one of these is the counselor uh, congruence or genuineness. And this means that the counselor needs to be um, genuine in who they are in the therapeutic relationship or the counseling relationship. This concept of congruence is used um, also by other humanistic approaches and it often refers to that your nonverbal and your verbal they are congruent. Those Everything of what you're saying and doing is real, it's authentic, um, that you are a whole person in that relationship. And um, so that's one of the full first elements. The second is that you need to have and be able to reflect back to the client an accurate, em empathetic understanding of their subjective live reality. Remember, the human is focused on the client's subjective live reality. And so this ability to um, attuned to that and accurately reflect that back to them is one of the is the second core condition. And then the final core condition is what they call unconditional positive regard. And by this Carl Rogers meant that you hold the client um, in in high esteem and, and you value who they are as a person. And this doesn't mean you necessarily agree or condone all of their behavior for working with a sexual abuse uh, perpetrator. This does not mean that you condone his or her behavior, but it, what it does mean is that you still have positive regard for them as a human being rather than seeing them as a monster. And Carl Rogers really, he was radical. He always seemed like this very nice, you know, gentle soul, but he was a radical thinker. Uh, and these, so his hypothesis is quite radical in that these three basic elements are sufficient for therapeutic change. And so that is the focuses of, a, of his approach. And I think, you know, what I want to add here too, some people think that's all there is to this approach. And there is a lot more. He actually had a way of conceptualizing change and watching the, you know, various stages of change. And so it's more, um, complex than I think a lot of people realize because uh, most people think this is all there is to the approach. And so uh, next I want to talk, talk about some of the myths of person-centered therapy. Person-centered therapy is one of the approaches where there are just a lot of misunderstandings and oversimplifications of the approach. Because uh, it's one of the approaches that when you ask therapists what approach they work from, a lot of people are going to say cognitive behavioral. And many others will say person-centered or humanistic, um, referring to this approach. Because most therapeutic and counseling training programs will initially teach therapists these core conditions and how to enact the relationship that Carl Rogers described. And that's where most, I would say, the vast majority of programs start. And yet, and so many people think that they have this, these introductory skill courses on reflecting and empathy and that, yeah, that makes me a you know, person-centered therapist. And there's actually a lot more. And if you're interested in working from this approach, I really strongly encourage you to do the reading, go to trainings, that there is real depth to this approach um, that often gets uh, glossed over and missed. So one of the common myths here is that um, that person-centered therapists or counselors are always nice and they always work to make clients feel good and that your only job is if the client feels good and that you're nice to them, that this is good um, humanistic approach and good person-centered therapy. And, and that's not true. I mean, Carl Rogers certainly is not as confrontational as, say, even a humanist like uh, Fritz Perls, a Gestalt approach. But they do confront inaccuracies, and they do hold people accountable, and they do have people, you know, reflect on their inconsistencies. That is part of what they do. They don't do it in, necessarily in a harsh uh, way, but it is done and it is not always nice or polite. And clients don't always feel good when you have to explore some of these more difficult um, issues that are just part of being human. Uh, the client, uh, person, the other another myth here is that the person-centered uh, counselors always validate their client's feelings and they always take that. And that means taking the side of the client. 
And so there's a very important distinction to be made, especially when you're working with a client who's complaining about a partner or a child or a parent, that you can, it's very important to be able to, in a very subtle skill, to be able to validate that person's experience of, let's say, their partner um, without saying, taking the client's side. Especially when you're talking, looking at couple relationships, there's always two sides to every story. And it's extremely counterproductive to take your client's side against their partner or their parent or their, you know, a child or whatever it is. And inadvertently, um, therapists do do this and it feels really good to have someone else take your side when you're angry at your partner or your parent or, your, you know, whomever or your boss or whatever it is. It feels good. And clients like it, and they will say, that was really helpful to me. But doing that without actually acknowledging, there's another subjective reality that they're in um, contact with, and that there's another reality that needs to be you know, understood to fully understand any type of conflict. So it's a very uh, important to, when you're validating their reality, to still make space and have the client be aware, this isn't the full story, it's just your experience of it. Um, uh, finally here, and this is one that is mocked in the movies, is one of the most useful techniques in um, person-centered therapy is, how does that make you feel? And I've seen it, you'll see it mocked in a lot of TV and movies because often people, when they first learn of person-centered they and the focus on emotions, they think that this is a really useful question. Again, um, if you become well-educated in this approach, Typically, questions are strongly discouraged. Instead, you to you know, how does that make you feel? Indicates that you don't have any empathy because you can't understand their their emotional terrain and their emotional experience as they're talking. So, in some ways, this question is counterproductive, or you know, does not um, express some an empathy for the client. It's curiosity about their emotions, but that's not empathy. That's different. And most clients find that this question highly annoying. And I think the fact that it is mocked on TV a lot is also an indicator that many people find this annoying. And even the TV spoofs on it make it very difficult to have this question. Um, and you can ask this question at certain times if you have strong rapport with the client in, the, in a particular context. You might be able to ask that question and have it be fruitful and useful. Um, but in general, you should, the goal here in this particular approach is that you are putting a period at the end of this sentence and saying, wow, you really felt betrayed, blah, 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 blah. And, and so I actually know one supervisor who trains in this approach and, you know, the one thing you can't do is, um, is, is to ask a question. He will take points off and uh, that's the, his, you know, he wants students to get through a session without um, asking a question. And so typically, that, how does that make you feel is not a really good person-centered question. But often, it's a place where many people will start, especially when they're doing role plays uh, in their early training. The juice, significant contributions to the field. And so in the case of person-centered, um, the contributions are, are quite extensive and in many ways have transformed the field, um, uh, yeah, um, from when you began to the current practice is very much in, uh, influenced and shaped by the original work of Carl Rogers. So uh, the most influential part is, as I mentioned earlier, are these core conditions of congruence, unconditional positive regard, and accurate empathy. And so this first concept here is, as I mentioned earlier, genuine or congruence, which is referring to the counselor's outer expressions being congruent to his or her inner experience. And, and this, it's interesting when you start looking across the appro humanistic approaches, Fritz Perls does this in a much more... To, um, I, harsh, for lack of a better word, I would say harsh way, in the Gestalt approach, where he's, um, where typically person-centered therapists would even would express um, disappointment or other such uh, thoughts, typically in a more gentle way, and I, I think 
you know, but there certainly is some mix there. So what genuineness and congruence looks like can be very, very different across clients and across counselors or therapists. And so, but again, it's that your inner and outer expressions are quote unquote congruent. And so that you're being fully genuine, fully human. And a lot of this is much more subtle than that. Um, there's been research done on um, the presence of the therapist and this therapeutic presence, they call it. And that's just your way of being in the room. And I've uh, looked at some of the research kind of correlating, you know, being, being able to be mindful of being in the moment and how that relates to creating this sense of therapeutic presence. And that means the client experiences you typically as being very, your, all of your thoughts and emotions and focus are in the moment, in the client's subjective reality. And that there is also this sense of, um, I don't know, I would call it calm. Um, but there's a quality that's brought there that's very palpable in the room. Uh, there was work done by Dan Siegel at UCLA um, on the integrated neural states and in that he talks about how when therapists are kind of in this optimal state of functioning, the various parts of the brain are functioning together, that there's intuition, there is empathy, there is compassion, uh, there's an ability to focus. And so they're starting to do even um, some more brain research studies on this state and quality of being when all of you is kind of, you're, you're firing on all cylinders, you're fully present, you're emotionally present, you're cognitively present, obviously physically present. Um, I guess with Skype, there is some different issues there, but you, you know, so that is what the client feels. And as I joke about Skype, I realize that's what a lot of people worry about in terms of trying to take this online. It's, it's more difficult to communicate that. Um, and so this is the state of being and that your state of being of, as the counselor, as the therapist in the room is very, um, influential and very much core and central to facilitating the change process. So going a little deeper here with this concept of unconditional positive regard. This is more than just being nice and polite. It, it comes down to very sincere and, and I guess for, for some people would even say spiritual. Um, valuing of your client as a human being in a very profound way. And it also acknowledges though that... Um, that we are all human and that we all suffer we and that we are very complex we have mixed feelings um, we have dark feelings we have dark sides and that this is all part of being human and so a very Pollyanna oh I love everybody doesn't quite capture the spirit here it is a much more it's a very difficult and for me I would say and for many people I would say it's a very spiritual um, process and a commitment to let's look at the darker side of being human and how do we find a way to have compassion and embrace that while still not, you know, tolerating that um, and working to reduce that dark side. How do we, that is a very complex um, process. Again, I, I'm going to give her an example. The um, a child, someone who's abused children or a child molester or a parent who, you know, has seriously maimed or even killed their child. How do you engage that with unconditional positive regard? That's complex. That takes a lot of work and I think a lot of personal development on the part of the therapist to learn how to, to not um, demonize or, or turn our clients into monsters because they have made some really horrific choices in their lives. How do we find their humanity and help them reconnect with their humanity? So this concept of un, um, um, unconditional positive regard can be very, very challenging, and yet it is pretty much put forth and posited as required on the part of the therapist in order to be able to help the client change and to facilitate change. And again, it's not something to be taken lightly or to, it sounds really simple and that's when you're working with someone who's very similar than you but when you start working with people with very different values um, who've made very different life decisions even cross-culturally this can be a very very challenging part of the approach for the therapist or counselor. 
So again, this concept of accurate empathy is another place where it sometimes gets oversimplified. You know, if you can just name and label their emotions and or just, you know, flesh it out a little bit further that, you know, you've, you've gotten it. But um, accurate empathy is a process where you're trying to literally map the internal emotional terrain is how I think of it, of the client. And it's important to know that often our emotions are totally contradictory. You know, as most people know, you can have very loving feelings and very hateful feelings for the same person, typically your partner or your parent. Um, so that's a very human experience. And so um, as a person-centered uh, counselor or therapist, you're always trying to uh, map that terrain and look for the subtleties in it and the complexities and the contradictions and not necessarily you can't necessarily always even straighten out all those contradictions so this this is a very delicate process and it's one where you want to you know when you reflect back someone's um, what, what you're um, perceiving within them you want to make sure that you've understood them correctly and you're humble enough to allow them to correct you and you ask for clarifications and so this is very much part of this um, process of accurate empathy and being able to understand their internal emotional landscape. So next let's move on to talking about the counseling process. Let's get a big picture of how this process works or how this approach works. So the person-centered approach is what they call a process-oriented approach. And what that means is that the counselor or therapist's attention is always on the process, what's happening in the room, rather than the content. Um, so the stories in who's mad at who for what reason, or who's sad about what for what reason. And so th the focus is always on the emotional process of what's going on um, with the client. And so it's how the client is interacting with the self and others. And typically those patterns repeat across different situations, different relationships, different contexts, as well as with the relationship with the self. And so you're focusing on the emotional processes in the client's life rather than um, the content of what the client brings, the specific complaints that the client brings. Similarly, as we're going to talk about in case conceptualization, Carl Rogers actually had a very clear um, uh, theory of change in terms of it moving through uh, seven different stages. And so it's a process of moving a client from um, this uh, state of not being very aware of their emotions, not being able to express them, to becoming a much, to moving through these various stages so that they're able to, to be fully present and experiencing their emotions in the moment and to allow even their whole identity um, to be much more fluid. And so this is also part of this process um, for treatment. So in terms of these seven stages of change, and a lot of people don't actually realize he had such a developed theory in terms of how he conceptualized the counseling process. Um, so in this beginning period, the person's personality is relatively fixed. Problems really may not be acknowledged even, and certainly they're often very difficult to even identify or talk about an emotion. And in the next phase, he or she becomes um, better able to open up to seeing the problems. And then in the third stage, the person be becomes able more to talk about their feelings that happened in the past. And so they're not, you know, hot emotions in the moment, but they're more in the past. And in the fourth stage, the person becomes more open to reconsidering how they construct their own identity and construct that of others. Um, and they're able to increasingly verbalize more deep and complex emotions. And then once you reach the fifth stage, they're able to increasingly, increasingly verbalize their in-the-moment emotions and experiences as they are arising. So being able to talk about how they feel embarrassed uh, as they share um, a particular um, story, maybe of, that was very difficult over a week, and being able to talk about the embarrassment about talking about those emotions, though that is the present moment, um, what's happening as the emotions arise in the moment. And so in the sixth stage, the person is able to experience very difficult emotions as they arise, and they're able to accept them and to not try to squelch them or deny them, 
or to pretend like they're not there, but they can feel that complexity of emotions um, with, with acceptance and then without reacting to it. And they're able to skillfully engage these emotions without making bad decisions, without attacking others, without attacking themselves. Um, and so this is this. And then, then finally in the, um, the seventh stage, and so typically somewhere in the fifth and sixth stage, clients find resolutions to problems like depression and anxiety and such. And then in the seventh stage is much more of self-actualization um, where the person becomes much more fluid in their whole experiencing of themselves, their emotions, and life. And so like this typically occurs outside of the counseling relationship. So next we're going to move on to talking about the counseling relationship in person-centered therapy. So arguably one of the distinguishing features of humanistic approaches like um, person-centered therapy is that the therapeutic relationship is viewed as the primary change agent in the therapeutic process. And this is very different um, than, let's say, you know, psychodynamic theory where um, the, the focus is on the insight through the relationship and that the empathy helps them, you know, have the insight. That's where the change happens. Similarly in CBT, you'll hear a lot more talk about, the, they talk about empathy now that as it being important and that you need to have a therapeutic relationship in CBT, but it's not the agent of change. And the agent of change is being able to alter behavior patterns and cognition patterns. So, the humanists are very different in focusing on this relationship as the primary um, the primary um, agent of change in the process. And so again, this therapist, is, as we've talked about the approach, is, it's kind of redundant to have this slide, but it is the format that follows the textbook. Um, the therapeutic presence, the core conditions, that is, those are the primary vehicles for change, and that's what the therapist and, count, and or counselor bring to that process. So next, let's talk about um, the viewing, case conceptualization and person-centered therapy. And again, this is a place where there's a lot of misconceptions, because many people end up thinking, oh, I learned person-centered therapy in my, you know, first semester communication skills class where I reflected feelings, and so now I'm a trained humanistic you know, therapist, and there's actually is a, a much more complex way of conceptualizing that Rogers used when working with clients. So, um, one of the first uh, areas of conceptualization is the ability to experience and communicate um, the self, and so being able to experience oneself and one's identity and, and ability to communicate that. Similarly, you will see this recognition of feelings. So can the client identify feelings in the past? Can they identify them in the present? Can they speak about them in the present? When they speak about them in the present, are they congruent? Are is their facial expression matching their words? So there's a lot of focus on that. And that, that kind of spills over, I guess, into the expression of emotions. So both the recognition and the ability to express them. Then there's this focus on present moment experiencing. Can you experience your emotions, your lived experience in the moment and accept it without trying to deny it, rationalize it, or otherwise, you know, separate from it? Can you experience that without being overwhelmed? So this isn't about just experience your, you know, anger and, you know, start raging. Um, this is about can you ex feel the fear, accept it, without um, and let it kind of move through and have the experience move rather than you know losing control hurting yourself or others is not part of this process they look at, and then another thing that he looks at or person-centered therapists look at is um, personal constructs so your how you're constructing your identity the stories you tell yourself about who you are as well as the facades. Um, Rogers used the term that we all wear these masks, you know, who we are at work or at school or with our friends or with our partner or with our families. Um, who we are at the grocery store. There can be these facades. And so Rogers very much believed that all of these facades caused a lot of suffering and caught, were the source of a lot of our problems. We weren't being our true selves. And so looking at those um, 
those constructs, you know, um, and another common one in terms of, you know, I'm an emotional person, I'm a logical person, I'm a smart person, I'm a dumb person. All of those constructs really don't actually hold a lot of water, although we build our identities upon them and they often become problematic. And so these are the um, uh, constructs that person-centered therapists will trace and help clients to explore, especially um, begin to explore them in the ways and to reduce the ways that they create suffering. There's also a real focus on complexity and contradictions that are part of being human, especially when you look at our emotional life. And so we're all riddled with multiple layers of complexity, contradictions, we're all hypocri hypocrites. And learning to engage that, um, skillfully manage that, learning to ex ex accept that others are equally complex and equally riddled with contradictions in a skillful way. So that's also very much part of the process. Um, also looking at perceptions of problems and responsibility. If you always think that the problem lays with somebody else and that someone else is responsible and they, you're unhappy so they need to be changing, the world needs to change because you're hurting, that is a very, um, at least from a person-centered worldview, very kind of immature way. And so, yes, you may have an unreasonable boss, and that is what you have. So, what, what, how are you going to respond? How are you, your respond? How are you responsible for that half? Just because they are rude to you, do, does that mean you're going to be rude back? And um, what's your responsibility in that? And so, helping clients um, look at how they perceive problems as well as how they take responsibility for that. And finally, um, more contemporary uh, person-centered uh, counselors and therapists talk a lot about peak experience and flow. And so this is when you're experiencing optimal states of being and how do we help clients experience more of that. And so these are the ways that uh, person-centered uh, counselors conceptualize their uh, clients when they come in and also they track this through the process of therapy so that they know when, where, and how to intervene. And here is a table. Um, it's also in the book. I know it's a bit tiny here on my PowerPoint slide, but it's really hard to cut it up. Um, but basically you can see the process here. There's one stages one through seven. And then each of these key elements, expression and communication of self, recognition of feelings, expression of feelings. Uh, you know, in the beginning, there's a lot less of all of this. And as you move across the seven stages, the person is able to be much more fluid in how they experience themselves, their identity. They accept that they can be different people in different contexts. They try to, they're aware of it. They try to, you know, um, they're responsible for it. And they also are able to experience their um, feelings and emotions as they arise with acceptance and being able to be responsible for how they manage those um, feelings as they arise in the present moment. And so this is the um, process or uh, the conceptualization of how there's this movement from stage one to stage seven that the therapist facilitates by using the core conditions. So next we're going to talk about goal setting in person-centered therapy. Now person-centered therapy actually has predefined goals that are part of the theory. So these are Goals that the therapist pretty much brings to the process and that are universal basically to all clients um, from the therapist's perspective. Now, I guess, you, you know, and especially when you move to the postmodernist, you know, do the clients agree to it? You know, what does this mean cross-culturally? And so those are all issues to be considered, considered, but it is one of the therapies that have embedded within it a long-term goal, unlike some of the newer, more postmodern ones that don't have necessarily a long-term goal embedded in the concepts of the theory. So basically, all person-centered and virtually all humanistic approaches have embedded within them the goal of promoting self-actualization, -actual becoming the person, the self that one truly is. So there's this idea of finding the true self that is embedded into the approach. And so this really f uh, refers to uh, fulfilling one's potential, being an authentic, having a meaningful life. And there is the assumption, this is one of the distinctions between existentialists and um, humanists, is that humanists really believe that hu everyone naturally tends towards positive, pro-social growth, 
um, and that it's, you know, traumatic experiences and other, you know, contextual issues that uh, thwart our, you know, kind of slow down our growth or get it off track. And so this is very much part of the more longer term late phase goals, but this is always kind of an assumption that is embedded within the um, theory as to where we're taking these clients when we work with them. And so also the goals when you write them up, and there are lots of these uh, examples in the textbooks, um, but they're process-oriented goals. So you're identi identifying areas um, where the person needs to shift their internal process, like reduce, you know, increasing the amount of responsibility maybe the client takes for working with difficult relationships at a work context or a school context or in a family context. So those are the more process type of goals that you would see in this um, theory. So next we're going to move on to talking about the doing or the interventions. And although this in many ways is a theory about your way of being in the room, there are nonetheless some interventions for which most new therapists are quite happy. So many of the quote-unquote interventions of person-centered are, are taught in early uh, skills classes uh, in both you know in counseling and therapeutic programs, social work programs, psychology programs, even in the peer counseling uh, models that are often taught um, in high school and even um, in undergraduate curriculums. So these are the basic uh, interventions that the therapist uses to help the client move through these seven stage, stages of almost like evolution of being human. So the first, as we've talked about, is the self of the counselor and the core condition. This is an intervention, who you are and how you are in the room, the presence you bring, your state of mind, your state of being, is very much part of the intervention, how you are and who you are. The second is what they call focused listening or attending. And so this is your ability to be a very focused and attentive listener. Often this may involve nonverbal, such as nodding your head um, and being able to listen and focus. And when I actually listen to clients, I have a video playing in my head of, you know, what they're describing. And I see their partner and their work context and their kitchen and their house. I have their whole house mapped up in my head. But there's this very focused listening where you're attending to what's going on. And typically, at least when I'm practicing, I, it's, I, I'm just fully there. There is, I really don't have other thoughts going through my head. It's a very focused, there's a discipline to a focused listening. So another uh, intervention um, is summarizing what the person has said. And you're, of course, summarizing key elements that are going to link up to the various processes that the therapist tracks. And often you're summarizing the emotional terrain of what they've described. And for many people, it seems very simplistic sometimes when you first hear summarizing. But for many people, it's very, very powerful to hear um, their experience summarized by another person, especially if they haven't told their story to many people very often. I was actually recently working with a man who had been the victim in a, a violent relationship and have just summarizing what happened was very, very powerful um, because this was not a story he had told to many people. Clarifying, the, again, seems very simplistic, can be very powerful. Clarifying is asking for details about um, trying, you know, to clarify so that you understand you know, what was going on. And, and so this, again, it's helpful to, for you to be accurate and understand what's going on, but it can also be very useful um, to them, especially when you're clarifying um, around emotions or intentions. Often this can be very, very powerful even for them. And then there is reflecting back the feelings, especially if someone comes in and they tell this story, oh my God, I can't believe so-and-so, la, 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 la. And often people will start like that. And the ther therapist or counselor's job is to take this drama tale or sometimes, you know, so, you know, sometimes it's uh, take the drama tale or maybe it's not even that dramatic, take the tale and to identify the emotional terrain. And sometimes even with the various characters can be very, very helpful of what's going on and reflecting that back to the client, especially if that wasn't clearly part of their story and or if they talked about it in a very intellectualized way. And by reflecting it, you, you, part of how you reflect is that you are present with that emotion. So when you say, 
wow, that really sounds very painful. It, it sounds like, you know, um, that must have felt a lot like a betrayal. You know, that type, you are in the moment. You're feeling uh, vicariously in some ways. Um, that betrayal or that painfulness, especially if they're kind of talking about it and they're very detached from their emotions, the more you can be doing that without being weird and extreme, because you can also creep people out by doing this, but being able to reflect them so that you kind of bring them slowly, you know, more directly in touch with those emotions. Um, Process-oriented questions are those questions that are going to link back to the various areas identified in the seven-stage model you know, so, so looking at the process, so identifying the feelings and looking at how did you express those feelings in the moment? Can you feel them right now? What are they feeling like right now? So, you know, t you know, tell me about when you put that mask on, what is that like? What's it like when you take the mask off? So here you're beginning to track the various levels of kind of um, personal evolution across the seven stages. So Person-centered therapists are really focused on these areas of emotional expression, personal construct, the facades, taking responsibility. So there are certain themes um, that the therapist is, the processes, internal processes that the therapist is focusing on. Um, they also get very concrete and specific, especially when talking about the emotional terrain. You know, was it sadness or is it grief? You know, is it a sense of betrayal? Um, are you, you know, is there anger in that betrayal? Is there more sadness in that betrayal? Is it something else? So getting concrete and specific. Self-disclosure is used by uh, person-centered counselors. It does need to be used carefully. And uh, initially, I think new therapists, and when I say new therapist, I mean the first five years often. Um, but using it with supervision, because I always say it's the one intervention that when it goes wrong, it's near impossible often to repair that because if you disclose something that makes the client feel like they can't trust you it's very difficult often not impossible but it can be very difficult to repair that rupture so you want to be very slow with that and it's a very it's a difficult inter it can be very very powerful but boy it can go powerfully wrong too there is confrontation in person-centered and it typically is a little less intense than maybe the gestalt uh, humanistic versions of therapy, but there is confronting the contradictions. You're saying you don't want your, you know, um, husband to shut down on you, but then you're saying you shut down on him, you know, or whatever that is. So you help point this out, these contradictions. There's immediacy talking about how the client is experiencing emotions in the present moment and often between the therapist and the client in the session right here, right now. Are you angry with me? How is it where, you know, how is that like for you? So, um, you know, you know, what else, you know, what is it you want to tell me? How do you feel I've, you know, um, not been, you know, appropriate with you or fair with you or accurate or whatever it is. So, and again, finally focusing. So if clients are all over the place, you're helping them to focus in on these core process areas so that, um, that they can recognize these processes and learn how to more skillfully deal with their interior life. And so these are a, a smattering of, uh, of interventions and it's important to know that just doing this doesn't make you a person-centered therapist, as many people sometimes get that impression from their initial skills training course. There's a conceptualization piece that's very important to really becoming a skillful person-centered counselor or therapist. So what not to do? There's actually a very um, famous and uh, skilled uh, collaborative family therapist, and one of his things he used to say is it's much easier for me to tell you what not to do than to tell you what to do. And along those lines, let's look at what um, person-centered therapists typically do not do. So one is to give the reassuring like, cliché, so, oh, it'll all be all right, you, know, you, don't, you shouldn't be worrying about that. I mean, this is what you get from a friend, and this is not what you're paying a therapist or a counselor for. You also want to avoid giving advice on how to solve problems. Again, this really just stops the whole process. The idea here is to have this person explore their own internal process more than solve the problem of the day. And so you're using all of their problems of the day to help them um, reflect on, better understand, more skillfully engage their interior process.
Next is um, requesting an explanation. So why did you do that um, uh, for their behavior? So the next two here are agreeing with the client and disagreeing with the client. And this is one that you normally learn the hard way in terms of, so agreeing with a client, wow, that seems like the clients love it usually. Most all of us love to be agreed with. It feels great. And so it's very tempting to just agree with clients, you know, get on their bandwagon. Yeah, your husband shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, that is very disrespectful of your children. I agree. So that's a very dangerous um, and not a very therapeutic or useful thing. It, it shuts down the process. It shuts down the, ex, ex, um, the client's exploration. And what you want to go in is to have them look at what is their half of those interactions? How are they experiencing them? How do they respond? What is their interior? You, so you want them to go back and explore the process around that rather than agree it was good or bad that so-and-so did X or that even the client did X. Another is obviously disagreeing with a client. And of course, um, this I think is more intuitively unhelpful in the sense of um, that when you disagree with a client, again, you're shutting down their reflective process. It's, it's not about the content. It's about the, their internal process and how they're responding to all of these, process, these challenges that arise in their life. And the last two here are giving approval and expressing disapproval. So the last one, expressing disapproval, obviously similar to agree and disagree, um, is probably going to upset your client, uh, rupture the therapeutic alliance, and be problematic. It also, uh, and more importantly though, really is that you stop them from exploring and being the judge of their own behaviors. It's not the counselor or therapist's job to determine whether or not the client has made a good or bad decision. It's the client's job to judge that. And then similarly, giving approval. And sometimes clients will ask you straight up for approval or for, you know, um, did, I, did I do it right, you know? Did I do the wrong thing? And so often clients will ask this very directly. It's very tempting um, to want to answer yes or no to those questions. And the clients would prefer we actually did that. Cause, but, you know, they can go to their friend, hairdresser, or bartender to get approval. What they're coming to a counselor or a therapist for, what they're paying all that money for, is for you not to give that approval, but to have them go in and determine as much as possible from their true selves, do they approve, do they disapprove, what ways do they approve, what ways do they disapprove of their own behavior, what do they like, what do they dislike. It's not your job to do that. They would prefer you come in and do that for them. It makes life simpler. But it, this is about engaging their internal complexities so that they can skillfully move through life and all of its complexities. So this is some of what not to do as a person-centered uh, counselor. So I also want to just touch on here that there are special inter interventions for special populations. Um, one of the more well-known ones is non-directive play therapy uh, developed by Virginia Axline. And she uses eight principles, humanistic principles, to um, facilitate a very similar process with children using play. And it is a non-directive approach um, that was developed short, you know, in congruence, actually, or at a similar time with Carl Rogers. And it's still very much in use today, non-directive play therapy. It's used a lot with um, children who've experienced traumas or having other internalizing symptoms. Similarly, there is expressive arts therapy, and Roger's daughter actually is a leader in this area. And this is using art with adults and um, as a way to express and experience and process their internal world. And so this is another form of um, therapy that uses these person-centered principles. And I think both of these are very um, closely aligned with how uh, the, the basics of Carl Rogers works in terms of how to facilitate a therapeutic conversation, but in these cases using art, one with children, one with adults and teens, um, to facilitate the exploration of that internal process. And again, helping them move towards greater self-actualization. These are discussed in my book and in lots of other books in greater detail. So next we're going to talk about the research and the evidence base. And many people are uh, not fully aware of how Carl Rogers was a, a dedicated, um, skilled uh, 
researcher. He developed research methods for psychotherapy, process methods, some of the first in the field. Psychotherapy is a very difficult thing to um, research and measure accurately, and especially when he um, is beginning to look at the internal subjective reality of people rather than measuring behavioral outcomes. He tried to find ways to uh, measure what was going on in the process of therapy related to the client's internal realities, objective realities. Very difficult um, to actually um, study these processes, but he was a very, he was a, a research, he used what was, uh, and I think very much developed the research practitioner model um, in terms of as a practitioner, you should be doing research on what's happening and that research should infer, inform your practice. So in terms of the research and evidence base for person-centered, the approach was really developed by Carl Rogers using process-oriented um, research methods. And so, and so the, the development of this approach, and he was exploring this hypothesis, are the three core conditions sufficient, um, necessary and sufficient for change? Um, many modern scholars would say that the three core conditions are necessary, but not necessarily sufficient for all clients to experience change. And so that's kind of where the, um, the evidence base is the mo at the moment regarding Carl Rogers' uh, hypothesis about the three core conditions being both necessary and sufficient. Um, in terms of evidence-based treatments that are humanistic, the most influential uh, many would say would be the emotionally focused couple therapy developed by um, Sue Johnson. There is, I do have a lecture online um, available on this approach, but it very much combines systemic thinking and, uh, and assessments and enactments very much with a humanistic uh, way of intervening along with um, attachment conceptualization of adult relationships. But her approach and how she intervenes, her way of being, is very much along the lines of what... Um, Carl Rogers pioneered. Similarly, the, there is a research movement, the common factors, and the argument here is, or the research findings here, of these researchers, and um, not all researchers agree on what is the best research, what constitutes research, what constitutes efficient research, but the core, uh, the common um, factors researchers would say that there's more similarities across therapy models than um, differences. Because when you look across therapy models and you account for um, researcher bias and other factors such as that, that most approaches um, fare similar. They have very similar outcomes when you compare for, when you start controlling for a variable such as, you know, is the researcher a cognitive behavioral therapist and what are they researching and what are they comparing it to? So, um, so that's the general finding and that when you start doing meta-analyses um, of the various outcome studies that they identified four common factors, or there are a couple different schools, but the most common ones, four common factors. These are all described often in too much detail in my book. Um, and, but the most significant one here is that 30% of outcome variance, so this is 30% of whether or not the client gets better or worse, is it can be attributed to um, the quality of the therapeutic relationship, um, specifically having those qualities that Carl Rogers um, advocated here. And so it's the single most... Um, it's, it's the single most important variable that therapist has direct control over. The only other one is 40% of client var uh, outcome variance is uh, client factors. So how severe they are, how motivated, what resources they have. Therapists can help clients activate some of that, but they don't have 100% control over that. But what they do have control over is the quality of the therapeutic relationship. The other two common factors are um, the interventions themselves, the techniques, as, um, as well as inspiring hope. Each of those are approximately 15%. And so, but of these, the, um, the, most inf the, most, the variable that the therapist has the most control over that has the biggest impact on whether or not therapy is successful is the quality of the therapeutic relationship. Um, um, uh, uh, Miller, Duncan, and Hubble have developed a um, session rating scale, the SRS, which is free and available online. And you can go to Scott uh, Miller or Barry Duncan's website. The links are, are in the book, my textbook. But they have um, a measure where the clients, you know, a very brief, super brief measure where the clients, you know, rate the quality of the, the session and the therapeutic alliance. And what they have found is that 
clients need to be have um, there's a, a there's a very low tolerance uh, in terms of clients need to feel like the therapist is uh, talk we're talking about the right things doing the right things and that there is a strong alliance in order for there to be um, positive outcome and and so it's it's really kind of surprising almost how high the cutoff score is and if you drop below I believe it's 36 on the 40 point scale. Um, that typically the light, there's not going to be a positive outcome and the therapist needs to work on the relationship. So this is something we have a lot of control over and it has a huge influence as, as to whether or not clients um, are, you know, resolve their problems through the counseling or therapeutic process. So next I just want to take a moment to talk about using person-centered therapy with diverse populations. So it is real important um, to remember that when working cross-culturally, cross-gender, even across social economic classes, that the expression of emotion um, is very much dictated by um, cultural and then within that gender norms for that culture. And so, for example, in Amer you know, American culture, um, it's a more emotionally expressive, but women have much more permission to express uh, softer emotions such as sadness, grief, and emotions in general than men do. And men generally have much more permission to have anger, um, but they are often mocked for having softer emotions. And they typically um, are socialized to not be particularly expressive. And so it's very important to uh, consider this and not pathologize what is socially normal. So a more restricted emotional expression is culturally within the norms. Um, in American culture. And then also looking at individualist versus collective values. Um, the embedded goal of self-actualization is closely aligned to, in to values in individualistic cultures such as Northern Europe and the United States of America, Canada. We, we, we tend to have much more individualistic values. And so when you're working with someone from a culture um, that has very collectivist values, especially if there's, you know, recent immigrants, even when I say recent immigrants, I think the first three or even, you know, those obviously who come in, their children, their children's children. I mean, often four generations in, you're still seeing many of the, the norms from these collectivist cultures. So there is an ethical thing to consider when working with someone from a culture that has um, much stronger values towards you. You do have to sacrifice some of your own needs, your own desires, your own fulfillment for that of the family or the relationship. And of course, yeah, so that's real important to consider because there is an ethical kind of bind here that in using this approach, you're typically promoting individualistic values rather than collective values. And I think that's something that um, a therapist needs to talk. And you can even talk about it and the paradox of, um, you know, someone often, if you're working in the United States, there are many, there are millions of people who uh, are very actively living values from collectivist cultures. And to be, but yet they're also living in the United States where many of these individual um, values are dominant. And so to have a dialogue and discourse about that um, is, is very important, can be very meaningful to help the, the individual more consciously and successfully navigate these different sets of values. And let me tell you, there's no simple answer here, um, but I'd certainly I think um, you can use this approach to identify those, but it's very important to do so um, when working um, with diverse clients. And so in terms of working with clients, um, uh, who are a gay, lesbian, transgendered, bisexual, uh, person-centered is frequently used with these populations because uh, the focus is on the subjective reality, um, kind of mapping the landscape, the contradictions, the facade is a very a strong theme often in working with these clients. And um, the whole coming out process is a process of self-actualization. It's often a very difficult and painful one, but it um, very much can be conceptualized along the lines um, that Rogers laid out in terms of becoming authentically, fully who you are. What is difficult is the um, discrimination, oppression, um, rejection, social rejection that a person experiences who, um, who are not you know, part of the heterosexual norm of their culture. 
So, so these are some of the considerations in terms of how to use person-centered um, approaches and ideas sensitively with various diverse populations. Well, I hope you have found this to be a useful uh, lecture and introduction to the work of Carl Rogers, really one of the most uh, brilliant thinkers in the field, uh, just uh, bringing just a spirit of humanity to the field in such a profound way. His, his influence really cannot be overstated, I don't think. And so I invite you, I encourage you to read at least one of his books if you're going to be part of this uh, profession of mental health and and to uh, explore this work in a lot more depth than maybe the average therapist or counselor or social worker or psychologist explores his work.